So, Reda, welcome. Jackie, welcome. Hi, Philip. Uh, yeah. Welcome to Room PRD here at the Montreal Heart Institute. We are ready for you. Are you, are you hearing well? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Uh, welcome. I think you will see we have a very challenging case here that I'm uh, confident to do with uh, Jackie Sa. Thank you, Jackie, to be here. She's, uh, as you uh, you know, probably one of the best operators around this world. Uh, we are, um, and I will not present everybody, We are, but we are working here as a team with the anesthetist Alain Deschamps, with Patrick Garceau, my colleague in ECHO. I think you will see it's very essential in a case like we are facing now. Uh, can I have my slide now? So we are going to present an, an interesting case of left atrial appendage occlusion, a uh, very sick patient. And the learning objective of this case is to discuss the indication of LA occlusion, discuss also the option to close the appendage, uh, transcatheter versus uh, surgical uh, closure, discuss the safety of procedures, especially in a patient with severe heart failure like this one, ejection fraction you will see was uh, is very low and discuss the management post uh, LA occlusion. So uh, I will do this case with uh, Dr. Jacqueline So, as I said, from Vancouver General. You can see the, 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 the team working with us today. So this is a 72 years old maid uh, referred by the EP service for uh, occlusion. Uh, long history of coronary artery disease, including cabbage in 2002. They did at the same time uh, an annuloplasty of the mitral valve, also an apical aneurysectomy of the left ventricle. He's known, uh, as I said, for ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, ejection fraction around 20% uh, with recurrent mitral regurgitation despite the uh, mitral valve repair. And now the uh, mitral regurgitation is at least moderate. You will appreciate that on the TE. Uh, history also of VTAC. It's not a surprise in 2011 with an ICD in place and a pacemaker and a CRT. So indication to close dependence, uh, permanent AFEM. He's having more than 65 years old and he's, he's having clearly heart failure. Not much more other risk factor, to be honest. Uh, but he's presented also very recurrent GI bleeding of unknown source. That's a very difficult uh, situation uh, where you cannot do mar uh, much on the GI side. He bled on warfarin. He bled also on a rivaroxaban. He bled on apixaban. Uh, so I think he's in difficult situation where he's re re receiving transfusion on a very regular basis. Um, in a case like this, we want to maintain the anticoagulation as much as possible. It was done. Uh, we, he was on Apixaban until two days ago. Uh, we bridge him with uh, a low molecular weight apron uh, fragment for two days. Uh, he was admitted yesterday and was kept on IV apron until the procedure today. And you will see, despite that, uh, we are facing a challenging uh, situation. We did a TE on him last week uh, while he was anticoagulated. We saw uh, no thrombus and we were able also to define the anatomy. The anatomy was appropriate for this procedure. And we sometimes do a CT scan that we did in this particular case. Uh, this is not routine for our center here, but it's quite routine in Vancouver, Jackie, for yeah, you. Eh? You, pretty, you do I that pretty much do for... CT before, that's correct. Yeah. So let's see what we saw on CT. Uh, the appendage is uh, it's quite large. Um, um, it's not a surprise with the uh, heart failure. It's also long, giving a good depth to deploy a device. And the shape is pretty much uh, windsock, uh, as we as we call. There's different shape. It's pretty much windsock here. Uh, it's quite large, uh, and the proximal portion was measured at 23 by 33 millimeter. Uh, so very oval. It's not unusual for an appendage to be oval. Again, a good depth for deployment of a device. But what we saw here on the CT scan, it was performed this morning, it's a thrombus, a thrombus in the proximal portion, actually, of the uh, of the appendage. Yeah, we, can, we are showing that to you here now with a pointer. And uh, it seems to be located in a very proximal lobe, not in the middle in the appendage, like it seems on the echo, you will see, but clearly a, a, a thrombus that was not seen before. Right, it's sitting deep in that proximal lobe anyway, so it's uh, within the distal part of that proximal lobe. Yeah. Yep. 
So we uh, did that pre-procedural TE a week ago, saw no thrombus that we are seeing right now, despite the fact that we maintain the anticoagulation. Uh, we are now in general anesthesia. T guidance, you will, we will review the echo image with uh, Dr. Garceau soon. We did so far the venous access in the vein, the right femoral vein. We can show that here. I put the 14 French sheet in place. Can you show the groin here? So I put a 40, uh, uh, sorry, a 16 short sheet in place. Uh, first of all, I pre-close the vein with a per-close. Uh, and then I, I put that 16 French sheet to do my transeptal inside and eventually the device delivery. Um, and now this just review the echo just to see what we, we saw before because uh, we, we really made a judgment call so far in this case. Patrick, can you show what we saw yeah. in the echo so far? <clears throat> so, yeah, everybody's hearing me. So the if you look at it, we go from a 45 degree up to a 120, and you're going to see. So as you said, as Rita said, it's a straightforward anatomy. And then there was that thing in the mid portion with a lot of smoke inside the appendage. We turn around. I'm showing you again some pictures. The thing is, it doesn't move at this uh, with the same as the wall of the appendage of the top wall. This was not there uh, on the previous the team. The prior, yeah. the prior team, yeah. right? Exactly. It seems, yeah. We decided to inject Definity, so it's our eco contrast. If you look at the first uh, passage or the the uh, early uh, contrast of the appendage, well, it didn't seem to be there, but we waited a little bit. It's like it went all around what we think is a thrombus, but then you wait a little bit and you you see this appear. It's not the usual uh, where you have a subtraction image where you see something black instead of all white. Serge, uh, being but, the only echographist on the board, yeah. uh, do you have any comments regarding? Uh, we, ha we, we have to, to take uh, uh, a lot of uh, attention because tr the contrast will do that to a thrombus. It goes around the thrombus and you, it disappears, but you wait a, f uh, a few seconds or a few minutes and then it comes back. So and it's not that I, clear. I but see, it, this, is I a clear, this is a clear thrombus. This. I see more smoke though. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so I measure it like uh, up to 13 by 6 millimeters. That's the measurement. We, we decided again to measure the appendage with what was 25 uh, of width and uh, 35 uh, of depth. By 3D, it was 28 by 21. And uh, of note, the, the patient had an alloplasty, which uh, you can see it there. And you see that there's a the essence of the alloplasty. There's a paranular leak right there at uh, with the plastic. So in summary, probable thrombus, which is at least 12 millimeters attached on the lateral wall of the appendage about uh, five, uh, about a centimeter deep into the appendage. So thank you, Patrick. I don't know what you think so far. Um, yeah, I think Jean, I think we have Jean Bernard with us. Jean Bernard, anybody else doing uh, LA closures in the room? Yep. No, Hi, Jean I'm Bernard. Jackie and Reda. This is uh, JB Masson speaking. Uh, have you? Uh, what's the the distance between the thrombus and the ostium of the appendage? So the the, 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 the thrombus is quite proximal, Jean Bernard, um, but it seems to be located at least on the CT scan in a lobe, in so, not in the middle of the. Uh, of the appendage per se. So uh, we can measure, Patrick, can you do that? The yeah. Measure the distance between the ostium or the uh, yeah. proximal portion of the appendage and the thrombus, but it seems to be at least one centimeter. Are, are you, you saying that, Jean Bernard, to consider yes. maybe too close with um, like an occluder like the Implatzer? Um, we, we certainly will. I think the, you know, the indication for 
protection against stroke is obvious now. Uh, the, the one thing I'm thinking about is that this thrombus arise on epixaben, which is arguably maybe not the more potent anticoagulant. And um, you could consider putting the patient on six weeks of uh, low molecular weight heparin or warfarin and, uh, and see if that dissolves the thrombus. Um, if if you're worried that the thrombus is, is within reach of the catheter. Um, I'm worried. I think that's a challenge here. Um, certainly on a CT scan, it appears to be a few lobes, and the distal lobe is clear, but this is actually in the proximal lobe, but in the distal aspect of the lobe. So with a pigtail, there's always that chance that, yeah, you could actually touch this uh, little, uh, you know, this uh, little uh, thrombus there for sure. Uh, there was a comment from someone else on the panel? Yeah, Jackie, it's Stefan. Uh, I was wondering, is there any, is it, could, in the case you'd be planning to do this procedure, could you do embolic protection and carotids and deploy filters or do something like that? Yeah, we haven't done that personally, but in a case like this, this certainly could be considered uh, likewise similar for the TAVI procedures for protection. We haven't done it for LA closure, though. What about you? Me, me too. I did not do that so far, but to be honest, uh, uh, Stefan, it's a great suggestion. Great, great, great suggestion. I think it, this is something that we should definitely, that we, we can definitely consider in this case. Yep. Yeah. I think the challenge here is that if this patient is. Oh, sorry, I'm hearing reverberation, sorry. So this, this patient has underlying chest fast score of three, clearly has the indication for anticoagulation, has been on multiple different types of anticoagulation for months and years, mm. and despite that, there is still this uh, filling defect. And uh, so we don't know the chronicity overall. We did see some artifact on the initial TEE, maybe yeah. it just wasn't quite as well visualized, but it would be surprising to see, you know, such a growth over this course of a week. So the challenge here is, you know, what, what do the panel think here? Um, you know, is this something we should proceed? Do we consider what JB was suggesting, intensify the anticoagulation? This guy is already getting weekly transfusion every two, two units every week or so. So that's a, that's a big dilemma here. I guess I'd like to hear from the panel. I guess it all depends on the risk of your procedure, right? Because a limited few people do this procedure. Uh, we all realize that this is uh, probably higher risk than if there was no thrombus, obviously. Um, and I guess the risk of bleeding is clear and is present. So I guess it all depends on what you assess, the, how you assess the, the risk of uh, embolizing the thrombus. I have a question here. Uh, uh, Rida Hai, this is Samar Mansour. Uh, the patient was on a full dose of Apix7 or it was a reduced dose? A uh, full dose of uh, Fragman? No, the Epic 7. Was it the 5 milligram BID or 2.5? Yeah. yeah, he was on full dose. He was on full dose. He, is, uh, he has a normal renal function, so he was on full dose of Epic 7, 5 BID. Okay. So, so I think that the suggestion of uh, JB to, to postpone and to try a few weeks of uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin to try to dissolve this thrombus before uh, the procedure maybe will put us in the safer side as compared to proceeding right now, because this is something that was not tried before, right? Don't forget that she, that he or she, I don't remember, but the patient is weakly transfused, which is uh, by itself a... You will be prepared for, for protection. If you go back in four weeks and you still see the thrombus, you will, you will take the Stefan's suggestion and have a device to protect the cerebral emboli. Because here, if he yeah. will stroke, right, he, if you, he will end the, at the end of the procedure, he will end with the stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, was the patient aware that there's a thrombus that wasn't seen before? Because I think that makes a big yeah, difference. Yeah, I let him know this morning. I let him know this morning after the CT scan. He's okay. aware. So, if, I mean, if you, I guess as long as you explain the risk to them of uh, embolization, uh, but I definitely, uh, I think that would be really, really important with the patient. What, 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 are their, what are they aware of the risks of doing it with this thrombus? Yeah, I think he's aware there's a risk. Uh, I said to him that we will, I, I'm not sure that we will go ahead, but uh, after discussion with, uh, with Jack here, we... Uh, we, because we think that the anatomy is a good anatomy for closure, uh, we are confident that we can do that quite straightforwardly without injecting contrast in the appendage. 
probably using the largest device watchman we were planning to use a watchman here we are confident that we are potentially can push away this device this thrombus uh, behind the device so it's why we decide to go ahead but i, I realize that there's a risk to do this and I realized that protection, embolic protection device, it was is probably a, a, an even safer way to do this. Uh, and so like if you the, the, the stress to those people who are not familiar with this procedure that uh, LA occlusion with thrombus has been done multiple times before, and yeah. and it's been done with great success uh, in people that had a tryout of anticoagulation and which this patient had, and the thrombus persisted, and the thrombus is not located very proximal or in the area where the device will be deployed then. And Reda and Jackie have performed cases with thrombus before, so this is, this is not completely uh, out of the out of questions or, or uh, out of correct. the experience. Thank you, Javier. Now, uh, let me show you what we did so far. So after like a like like long discussion, we decided to go ahead with the transeptal. It was not easy because the, because of the uh, enlargement of the right cavities. I was able to reach a PFO, a PFO uh, but I, I was not uh, I was not really um, interested to cross the PFO because typically when you cross the PFO to go in the left atrium, you end up to anterior. You see that I think on DT now that we. Across the PFO, we are just behind the aorta and to anterior. But I used that. I used the uh, the fact that I was in PFO to turn my needle to, towards the posterior aspect here of the septum, and I was able to cross using the RF energy uh, transeptal needle by Bayless. I uh, use also the Mullen sheet, and now I put the uh, wire uh, is. Uh, Pro track wire in the left atrium. See, it's a loop wire, very safe to bring my delivery sheet for the, the device. I'm coming with the delivery sheet. Uh, this is a 14 French delivery sheet that I insert inside my uh, short 16 French in the groin. I'm crossing now the septum. There's several markers on the sheet. Uh, and there's different shape of the sheet. Um, Jackie, do you want to comment on the yeah, shape sure, that we yeah. select? So there are three different shapes. So there's this double curve sheath, which is more the workhorse for most individuals. Uh, there is a single curve sheath, and there's the anterior curve sheath. For this one, because we wanted to get to the distal lobe that's anterior and superior, we decided to go for a double curve sheath. And, and these are 14 French, uh, 75 centimeter length, and the uh, inner diameter is 12 French. I think you can appreciate on echo that we are just facing the appendage with the sheath. Uh, it means that we have a good transeptal puncture, uh, and a good, a good location for transeptal puncture for a case like this, it's posterior and inferior to reach the appendage in a good position to, to go uh, inside. So there's three markers in the sheet, and uh, in the marker that we need to reach at the osseum, it's the more proximal marker. There's a distal marker on the sheet that you see uh, reflecting pretty much the tip. But the the, the this one that it's more the, the marker that is most far of this one it, it, this is a marker that we should put at the proximal portion of the of the uh, appendage. Right. So there there are five different sizes of these devices. So from 21 to 33. So the most proximal marker will be the marker with that we like to use for the 33 millimeter device that we chose for today. And that marker has to sit within the orifice of the appendage uh, to give us uh, enough length to deploy this 33 millimeter device. Okay, I will advance now the wire. I will, now I, we need to be careful because the, as you remember, the, the, the thrombus was quite proximal uh, and, and uh, inferior. So I really want to turn my sheet up to try to go in the upper part of the appendage to try to minimize the risk to touch this thrombus. And I want to go as far as possible because we will need some depth to deliver the device. The device that we select was the 33 millimeter device. Yes. Uh, yeah. Typically, the device is as long as big. So, if you have a 33 millimeter device, we need a, a depth of at least 33 millimeter. And on the echo, we had me measurements up to 34. So that's that's good. I'm just in front of the thrombus that I'm not touching yet. Uh, we can potentially show the device before. Uh, yeah. Can I can can I recuperate the uh, my slide, please? Uh, 
PowerPoint slide. I want just to show the device because the device is preload. And this is the device that we're going to put in place. And this is a Watchman uh, device from Boston Scientific. That device is approved since March 2015 by the FDA. It's also fully approved in this country. Um, in January. January and this is the uh, characteristic of the device. Do you want to describe maybe, Jackie? Sure, yeah, let's just go over that. So um, when it's, the device is constrained within the sheet, it is as long as it is wide. But when it's actually deployed, you can see that the, the, the length of it is less so than the width. But nevertheless, we still need that depth to accommodate the size of 33. You need 33 depth. So there are five different um, sizes, 21, 24, 27, 30, and 33. You can see from the structure here, there are 10 hooks that are attached essentially at the distal third of the device. And about half the surface of the device is covered by this PET membrane, which is porous, and it tends to endothelialize at least in animal models in about 30 to 45 days. And um, so I think we're ready to go. Yep. Do you want to go to an aerial caudal view? So we can potentially see? bring the device on the sure. table because okay. uh, the device is preload. We are not going to be able to show your device outside the, uh, the, the sheet, but okay. see, it's, it's preload. It, it was already prepared and flush. Uh, and I have the, the delivery sheet in place here. I don't want to lose any time in this case. We will go fast, as far as possible, independent, inject no contrast, just to, to minimize the risk of thrombus dislodgement, and deploy this device uh, as, as fast as possible. So uh, we are ready to go. Uh, Jackie, have the wire? Yeah, quick, yeah I'll hold the wire. Keep the wire, please. Uh, w to be safe, we typically put the pigtail in front of the delivery sheet. It's always safer to put the pigtail in front to avoid to perforate the appendage because the appendage is quite uh, fragile and you can easily perforate. So I will follow on this pigtail with my delivery sheet to go as far as possible. You can see on a TE image that he's uh, beyond that thrombus location is in the deep part of the appendage. Oh, we'll go to Ario Caudal. Now we, uh, we go Ario Caudal to have a better profile. I'm quite far, isn't eh, Patrick? Yes. Sorry, it's a very... Your thinking is that you're in a different lobe than the one in which the thrombus is located? Absolutely, yeah. On the CT, it's clear that there is an anterior superior distal lobe. That's the bulk of, the, of the, this appendage is in that direction. So where the sheath is currently, we're deep in that anterior superior lobe. So do you feel that we are far enough, uh, Jackie? You want me to push a yeah, bit more? Yeah, you know, you can go into the 135 view on TEE. That would help us see that anterior superior lobe better. Yeah. And I don't want to waste too, too much time here, but on fluoro... Now, your pigtail is as deep as it can be, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, it can be a Let's bit more. A bit yeah, more. yeah. Let's Perfect. go a little bit more. So you can see on the TE view where the sheath is, is to the right side of the screen, and uh, you can see a silhouette of the pigtail marker there. So that he is located in the superior anterior lobe, essentially. And then when Reda gives a bit more of a counterclock, it'll actually reach up superiorly even better. And See, um, so that's a really good position. That's you a are very well good, yeah. There. yeah. Yeah, on Echo, it's a very good position. It seems that we are not in the lobe where the thrombus is located. That's correct. I want to maintain that very good position now in the appendage. I will remove slowly my uh, pigtail, and we are going to be able, able to deliver the device. Again, I'm removing so this pigtail. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll go in apnea. I'll let you go. You can open more. Just to be sure that we're not perforating and we're not moving too much in the appendage. And I will let Jackie uh, deploy this device. So I will advance. If you're holding the counterclock on the sheet, perfect. I'm holding the counterclock just to keep the nice position in the appendage. You can see this uh, delivery sheet distal marker coming forward. And I'm going to align this to the very distal aspect of the sheath, of the excess sheath right here. And right at this moment, I'm going to just snap it yep. by pulling back the proximal sheet. Of course, you never want to push this device in front of your delivery sheet because you will definitely perforate the okay. appendage. So Red is going to hold a counterclock for me, yep. and we're going to go ahead and deploy this device very slowly here. Patient yep. is under apnea, so we are not anticipating any sudden respiratory motion. And some operators like to deploy this fast, but, uh, but I like to deploy really slowly, especially for a big device like this. You don't want to have it jump forward. So here I'm putting a little bit of tension once most of the feet are out and a bit of tension and uh, we try to minimize that. So that looks pretty good here. So we, we can anyway, breathe. Yeah. 
We are quite far in the appendage, to be honest. If more distant than I would expect. It is it's actually deeper than we thought. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the challenge is because we couldn't give much contrast. So we can't see where the alignment of, exactly. that, the, of that marker was. But it's not bad, actually, at this location. So the question is, do we want to actually... Uh, so this is a good view, actually, on the T. If you can put some color flow Doppler on it, yeah. are we missing a lobe to the left side of the device? And so it does appear deep for sure. So yeah. I think the challenge is I think we'll have to, to think about doing a partial, partial yeah. recapture, I guess. Huh, here? Yeah, yeah. Are, we, it, are, are we are we seeing some thrombus proximal to do to 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 the to the occluder? You know, when there's the device and the, the delivery cable in place, it's very hard. We often see this artifact uh, from just the from just from the cables, so that doesn't really indicate that it's a thrombus there. I suspect that it was not. Uh, I will do still a partial recapture. I can recapture the shoulder of this device and redeploy. I should end up more proximal. Yeah, it's really moved back more proximal. You can see the proximal part of the device being more expanded at this point. I think that looks pretty good here. I think I don't see know, any thrombus anymore. No, I, don't to see be that. I think it's behind it. Can you? We're behind. One yeah, we're behind. Again there. Yeah. Just take a, take a look in the long axis view. Yeah, you want the uh, 135. Yeah, go to the 135. Yeah. You can yeah. see the device is well opposed against the wall here. Uh, so actually, take a look at that left segment let's make sure that there is no color flow doppler across that i think it it's behind like yeah it looks little. okay yeah i think if you do a gentle little tuck it will move it proximal and i think that will be done so we can we always tug on this device to be sure that it's well attached inside and often when we want to have a more a bit more proximal uh, location we we pull we, we just do the tug and it ends up a bit more proximal it's going back well to yeah, the initial it's, position it's well stabilized uh, you see you can see with a tug that's pulling the tissue but it gives back and falls back into position here and there's really not uh, much period device leak over here i'm hardly seeing little dot going across. You can measure that, but it looks like it'll be less than a millimeter overall. Um, I mean, generally after the device deployment and after tugging, we will look at four different views and make sure that uh, number one, we meet, we meet our compression compression measurement between eight to 20%. And we also want to make sure there's no peri device leak that's more than five millimeters. And uh, if it's a tiny little one of, you know, one or three, we tend to generally leave that. But certainly, usually during a procedure, not more than three millimeters. But we'll, we'll see in this various different views. I think that we have a good uh, location, I think. A good compression also, 24, 24 25. Right. So uh, yeah. it's a 33 millimeter device. So we have more than 20% compression yep. here completely. And you can see also from the shape of the device, if it's pumpkin shape, that usually means it's not well compressed. But if it looks like this, more like a strawberry, uh, you can pretty much expect you have you know, reasonably good compression here. And here, you know, the, the, the you know, uh, you know, better is the enemy of good, you know? Yeah. So, so, I mean, obviously we can do another partial recapture if you want to reposition it in the more proximal location, the more tug, but given the thrombus and location here, I think we want to minimize the nucleation of this device if we can. So here we're yeah, measuring 25, 25 millimeters yeah. again. Again, you know, good compression. compression. More than 20% compression. And the ACT was maintained over 300 for for the most part of this procedure. So that's uh, uh, anything more than 250 to 300. That's uh, perfect for the procedure. How about now? Being, yeah. being the only expert on the, on the panel now, any comments on the, on the procedure? I think this was very well done. Um, there's, there's obviously a, somewhat of an incomplete occlusion of the proximal portion of the appendage, which is almost always the case with the watchman. However, the data suggests it, there's no harm to it. And, and obviously in this case, they want to avoid excessive manipulation. So I would tend to agree to leave it where it is. Um, there's, no, there's no gap. Uh, the, the proximal portion that's left uncovered has no trabeculation that I can uh, see. And I'd be very happy to, to call it quit. Perfect. Can we take a look at the other views, maybe like 45? 
Euh, tu pourrais peut-être un crâniage aussi, toi, Dana, de ton côté? So what we look for uh, before we release this device is the pass criteria. So pass P for position to make sure that the device shoulder is at least at the level of the circumflex or proximal. Anchor for A, which is uh, the tuck test, which was excellent, that you've seen Reda do that a few times. The device was very stable. And the last two S and S are size and seal. So the size we talked about, 8 to 20% compression and seal is no peri device leak that's more than uh, uh, 5 millimeters. So, uh, by all accords, it's met all these yeah, criteria. It's so good. Est-ce que tu peux mesurer, Vicky, ici la compression? Here we will show you. We just did the uh, CNA of this device. You see that the, the device is. Uh, is just behind the mm. circumflex artery. We have, we are lucky here. We see well the circumflex. It's calcified. Uh, so the device is just behind the circumflex artery. We are going to measure the degree of compression again, 24 uh, on uh, fluoro, uh, pretty much, uh, pretty consistent what we with what we saw on echo. Um, so yeah, I guess we are good. good. I think it, it looks good. Huh? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree Minimum that we are happy uh, yeah. with this device? Reda, Reda uh, Stefan, uh, what is compression? What it, what do you mean by compression? It's a naive question of someone who doesn't do yeah. that procedure. So uh, the, the device, the nominal size of the device is 33. You don't want to reach uh, that 33 because it means that the device is fully Slowly. expanded. Right. It's floating. Yeah, it's potentially yeah. not holding in place. So, yeah. you so, so two two mechanisms that keep this device in position. One is the radial strength, and one one is the distal hooks. There are ten of them, as I mentioned earlier. But the radial strength, uh, you really need that compression. So typically, we say at least eight to twenty percent. And most of us actually end up going for more like twenty percent or even twenty-five to thirty percent sometimes. And uh, so this, you know, reduces the chance of embolization. On the screen, uh, there seems to be a big V wave. If that's uh, auricular pressure, uh, do you uh, do you uh, plan to uh, address the uh, paravalvular leak, or do you have an explanation for that? <laughs> no, it's definitely the, the essence of the uh, mitral ring. Uh, I'm I'm uh, open to uh, to close this. To be honest, this is something that we can close, uh, even if it's not a bio procedure. It's a ring. Uh, so, but, but the patient is quite stable on the heart failure side, to be honest. Uh, but if he if he's presenting refractory uh, refractory heart failure, we, I'm definitely open to to close this. This is something that we can address uh, with plugs. She has a sheet in and he do it. Should do it now. I'm just questioning the, no. big, I'm just questioning the, the big V wave on the screen. That's it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it seems to be pretty significant to my eyes, although it's pre pre pretty small on the screen here. In the, in the LVOT view of the mitral valve, which I, I was looking at, it looked like there was a gap there. I know there's some artifact because of the ring, but I wonder if you put color on the mitral valve because I was wondering the same thing. Can you show, Patrick, yeah. the, uh, the instance of the mitral valve? I think it's a, it's very interesting. It's a really medical surgical. Yeah, see, there's a, the MR is really in the decence. So you can really you can really see it in uh, in the LVOT view. So so interesting. I read that the the prosthetic device yeah. in the left atrial appendage does not interact with the valve at any point, right? It never does. No, exactly. Not at all. This is right. something less concerning with this device, but with other devices like the Amplatzer, where we cover the orifice, there's a big disc, and we always want to be sure that we are not interfering with the mitral valve uh, and the pulmonary vein. But with this device, it's not a it's not a concern. This is really a different mechanism of closure, where we exclude more the let's say the middle and the distal part of the appendage, and not really the the proximal the portion per yeah. se. Mm -hmm. So if you're at, if the patient is doing fine, I think we should leave it there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think so. yeah, we should release the device and so let's release the device. So the device is still attached. It can still recapture the device at this point. But if I recapture uh, fully the device, I, I will not be able to re uh, re to reuse this uh, device. I will need to use another one. But of course, we are happy with the position. I just I just need to turn counterclock to release this device. I will advance with the delivery sheet close to the tip, and I, I will turn four or five times, it should release the device. Did not see much movement after the release. 
it's all while you're working we have a question in the room uh is working yeah just have a question the clue was to uh, to occlude completely the the appendage to avoid uh, thrombus but here we didn't close it completely but you are not afraid that the, she will have another because you want to you were you want to stop the anticoagulation so we don't reach the 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 the, 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 the thing uh, we're thinking about because you stop anticoagulation with anticoagulation she has already a thrombus and the gap you have, you will have also some thrombus formation after uh, stopping the anticoagulation. Yeah, we didn't really have a gap here. Um, what we did see was slight little blip of uh, colorful doppler cross that was less than a millimeter. So technically, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the definition for procedural success, with the Watchman device is less than five millimeter, with the Amplatz device less than three millimeter period device leak. So, so this was not what we would consider as having a residual gap over here. Now, the data is very different for surgical uh, occlusion, however, you know, but for the endovascular devices, this this would uh, meet the criteria for successful technical success. And so we are clearly, I think. So with the watchman, you don't need to totally exclude the LAA uh, to have clinical success. Is that what I understand? Yeah, because from, it, from what we've seen, yeah, from what we've seen from the Protect AF and Prevail data, um, so if there's anything greater than five millimeter, they will continue the oral anticoagulation beyond the 45 days at the TE follow-up. If there's less than five millimeter of peri-device flow, then uh, then warfarin will be stepped down to that therapy out to six months, and then aspirin alone beyond that. Um, so it's the five millimeter cutoff for the watchman. And based upon what they've seen on protect and prevail, you know, there has been no association with these small degrees of leak to thrombus formation or, or stroke uh, issues related to ischemic strokes or thromboembolic events. Um, so there's been um, no consequences, negative consequences with these small little leaks, at least for the endovascular device. The way I understood the question, the question was related more to the, the proximal portion of the appendage that was left uncovered than the uh, the very small yeah, gap. You, so maybe you, you want you to comment to, on this? Yeah, to, you need to be careful here. The uh, the Coumadin ridge, meaning the ridge between the appendage and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the left upper pulmonary vein, it's quite long. You cannot cover all that region with the device. Uh, so this is not the appendage per se. I mean, it's more the cumulin ridge, and, uh, and and there's nothing much more that we can do in this case. So here with the device, you see well that we are covering well the region where the, the thrombus was located. We exclude also well the distal part of the appendage. So I think it, this is this is a good result. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also approximately there's no trabeculation. Yeah. Devices like this or uh, in this type of position has been left for in you know in the clinical randomized studies with, with no negative consequences. So this is uh, highly acceptable results here. Okay, so maybe so we can give you the, the, the to the right side. And yeah. Last question. Yes, but maybe we can give uh, Reda and uh, Jackie the uh, the conclusion remarks, and then we will go on to uh, uh, another version of the left atrial appendage closure. So, uh, Reda, would you want to? So thank you, Philip. I think it was uh, for us. It was it was definitely a challenging case. Um, I was glad that you were here, Jackie. Uh, and I don't want by any way, any say, any way, it means uh, uh, promote promote the closure on a routine basis of appendage with clot inside. Absolutely. This is this is uh, exceptional cases. But we are facing often difficult situations like this one, where we need to do judgment call and find a good, uh, a good uh, solution for the patient. I like the suggestion of embolic, uh, embol uh, protection. embolic protection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is this, this is the, the that we think the, the thing that we need to do next time, probably in a case like this. Uh, if it's available, it's not easily available, right. but we should probably use that more and more often in our practice in very selected patient. Jackie, you have something to do to say? No, I think this is definitely a very challenging scenario. You know, thrombus in LA definitely is one of those contraindication. But as, as we've mentioned, many of us deal with these ch challenging patients in Canada because they are contraindicated to anticoagulation, and despite giving them you know, anticoagulation, sometimes clots still persist. In those cases, we do the procedure, but do it very, very safely and, and making sure that the patients are on, are knowledgeable of the risk, the increased risk of such, uh, um, you know, incidents of clot imposition. So I think that that's a really key thing that patients, the decision comes 
you know, comes into a decision as well when we do such procedures. So I just now need to remove my uh, my introducer sheet in the groin. Uh, I will just pull on the 16 uh, French sheet, uh, pull on my per close. Uh, it should be done. Uh, I'm not expecting too much bleeding, even if we are fully anticoagulated since the beginning. I can I can show you that at the end, but it should not be it should not be a big deal. Can can you show the groin? I don't see the groin. I'm just pulling on my sheet and on my suture here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you will see another good option, uh, the surgery in a tape case. Uh, and thank you for your attention, your good comments. There was a question in the room. Is, there, is that still a... I think Dr. Pennison had a question for you. Uh... Okay. Uh, so what if the patient had hemolysis? The, 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 the patient had hemolysis, uh, clinically speaking? No hemolysis, no. No hemolysis and heart failure is moderately well controlled. Because the question was regarding the, the, the valvular leak. So no hemolysis. Uh, <laughs> no hemolysis, no. no. So thank you very much for this very elegant demonstration of a complex case. Uh, again, uh, complex interventions and live interventions of, often go hand in hand. So thank you very much for dealing with this uh, for us. And uh, we're very impressed with the result. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.